This video is sponsored by Brilliant. The first 200 people to go to brilliant.org slash polyphonic will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Nowadays, it's nearly impossible to have a conversation about musicals without name dropping Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice. As a duo or paired with other artists, these men have become titans looming over the musical world for the past half century. Of all their collaborations, however, there's one that's always resonated most with me. Jesus Christ Superstar. Reinterpreting one of the most important stories of human history, Jesus Christ Superstar brings the ancient face to face with the modern, and in doing so, it forever changed the way that people thought of musicals. Let's take a closer look. In 1968, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice broke through into the mainstream with Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. When they went to follow it up, they decided that one biblical story worked for them, so why not pitch another? So they came up with a radical idea, one that would tell the story of Jesus Christ through the eyes of Judas. And on top of that, they would forego traditional musical theater for something more contemporary, rock. When they took it to producers, they were promptly told it was the worst idea in history. But that didn't dismay the duo. They knew they had something with this piece, and they were determined to make it work, even if it required turning away from the stage. In the late 1960s, the rock opera was in the process of being born. Albums like SF Sorrow by The Pretty Things and Tommy by The Who were experimenting with the narrative abilities of rock and roll. This inspired Weber and Rice, who thought that the rock opera might just be the medium to tell their radical story. With this new media in mind, Weber started shifting his writing. In his mind, this was going to be a rock album, so it should be written as a rock album, not as a stage musical. Because of this, he focused on telling the story through the music. And just as Weber sought to pull influence from popular music at the time, Tim Rice also let the songwriters of the day seep into his lyrics. One of the biggest influences for Rice's perspective on the story came in Bob Dylan. Dylan's song, With God on Our Side, featured the line, You'll have to decide whether Judas Iscariot had God on his side. This was a thought that had always fascinated Rice, who felt that the Bible's depiction of Judas was written as a cardboard cutout of an evil character. Rice's take on Judas, however, is completely fleshed out, and presents a remarkably sympathetic case for one of history's most reviled figures. We're introduced to this story through Judas's eyes. Our first lyrics on the album are sung by him. My mind is clear now. And we start with a revelation. If you strip away. Heaven on their minds shows the perspective of Judas. He yearns to help the poor, to help the cause of his people, and that's why he took up with Jesus in the first place. But what Judas can't abide by is the talk of Jesus as a messiah. He cares for his friend Jesus and for the cause of his people, and this desperation and care come through perfectly in both the music and lyrics of Heaven on Their Minds. Musically, it starts on desperation before oscillating back to warm compassion, building to a last desperation once again in the end. All of this was made possible thanks to an incredible performance by Murray Head, who was then an up-and-coming singer, not really making many waves in the scene. But when Rice and Weber found him, they knew he had the chops to be their Judas. And Murray Head wasn't the only one pulled from obscurity. Yvonne Elliman, who played Mary Magdalene, was also an unknown when Andrew Lloyd Webber came upon her. He was scouting a jazz club to see if the headliner could play Pontius Pilate. And while that singer wasn't a fit, Elliman opened the show and Webber thought she would be the perfect Mary Magdalene. In Rice's characterization, Magdalene is a warm, loving character, and Elliman's voice fit that role perfectly. In Everything's Alright, we get a peek into the relationship she has with Jesus. She's a foil, calm, grounded love, paired with the passionate idealism of Jesus. Rice's Jesus is an interesting figure. He's more passionate and angry than many depictions, but he also needed to have the charisma to move crowds and the ability to sing Jesus's pacifism. Weber and Rice found a singer able to do all of this by looking to rock. Weber heard Deep Purple's 1969 album, In Rock, which featured Child in Time. 
In that song, lead singer Ian Gillian captures both the highs and lows necessary for Jesus, and particularly the doomed desperation. The climax of that song features pained screams like no other. When Weber and Rice approached Gilliam, he was game, so they had their cast in place and worked on putting together an astounding album. After we're introduced to all our characters and their motivations on the first side, the second kicks us into action. In the triumphant Hosanna, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem with his followers. The passion that Jesus' followers have for him carries through the next song, Simon Zealots slash Poor Jerusalem. In that song, Simon tries to convince Jesus to march to war. Musically, the song is a triumphant celebration. Weber writes a catchy chorus line to show the manic devotion of Jesus' followers. This song is a perfect display of the dichotomies that make Jesus Christ Superstar so vibrant. Simon Zealots is fast-paced, loud, and climactic, but it runs headfirst into the slow, piano-driven Poor Jerusalem. In that song, we get to see Gillian's softer side as he reflects on some of Jesus' burdens, ending on one of the most powerful sentiments of the album, To conquer death, you only have to die. To conquer death, you only have to die. This goes on to a mystical scene where Pilate dreams of his fate above twangy guitars. Meanwhile, Jesus visits the Temple of Jerusalem in one of the most cinematic scenes in the album. It's easy to see the chaos of the market, painted by an enthusiastic bass line and a building cacophony of voices, strings, and horns. Throughout Jesus Christ Superstar, Weber reuses and recontextualizes his musical themes. The temple is a perfect example of this. The theme of the merchant's hawking wares gets reused for the desperation of lepers and beggars. In this context, it carries the same chaos, but it also seems haunted, building around a helpless Jesus. This is followed up by a brief reprise of Everything's Alright, and then Mary's shining moment, I Don't Know How to Love Him. This was actually a recycled song for Weber. He had originally written the song about his home state of Kansas, but Rice's new lyrics provide a deeper look into the psyche of Mary Magdalene. On one level, it's a song about unrequited love, but on another it begs a more profound question. How do you love somebody that believes they are a god? I Don't Know How to Love Him is the emotional core of the album and was released as one of its two singles. I seem like to end the second side of the record, we go back to Judas and his despair. In this scene, Judas sells Jesus out, but we can understand his motivations for it. He's seen the mobs that Jesus inspires. He's worried for the fate of his cause. I came because I had to, I'm the one who saw. Jesus can't control it like he did before. Murray Head's performance in this scene really convinces you of Judas' cause. He comes off remarkably sympathetic. Even though he thinks he's doing right, one thought is burned into his mind. If he's wrong, he'll be damned for all time. With this, we go to the second disc, where we're greeted with one of the most iconic scenes of Jesus' life, The Last Supper. This song is an entire suite, and it shows off both Gillian and Head's remarkable performances as they face off against each other. The Last Supper leads into Jesus' soliloquy in the Garden of Gethsemane. If I Don't Know How to Love Him is Mary Magdalene's showcase, Gethsemane is Jesus's. This soliloquy is a beautiful look into the mind of a man condemned to die. Ian Gillian portrays Jesus's own internal turmoil, even questioning himself and his fate. Show me just a little of your omnipresent brain. And it ends with an angry acceptance. Jesus didn't start this, but he'll finish it. I will drink your cup. When Jesus has resigned to die for humanity, the rest of the album is a march towards the impending crucifixion. This section shows off more of Weber's theme reuse. The Apostles' What's That Buzz is reused for Jesus' arrest, and its other half, Strange Thing Mystifying, finds another home in Peter's denial. 
Once Jesus is arrested, we get a tour of his trials. Pilate is jeering and sinister, prodding at Jesus only to be met with placid responses. But are you king? King of the Jews? That's what you said. Then we get another highlight, King Herod's song. Like I Don't Know How to Love Him, this song was taken from a previous Weber composition. Because of this, it's the closest to traditional music. Herod sings in jaunty show tunes. So you are the Christ, you're the great Jesus Christ. Prove to me that While Jesus is being tried, Judas is wrought by his own conscience. In a reprise of Damned for All Time, Judas returns to the priests in desperation, regretting his actions. But I only did what you wanted me to. Then we get Judas' own take on I Don't Know How to Love Him, showing a last moment of empathy and care. Judas truly loved Jesus and did what he thought would be best for his friend. It's a painful, tragic final moment for our main character. And then as he dies, we revisit the opening of the album. His mind is no longer clear. His mind is in darkness. As he dies, Judas realizes he was a pawn in God's game, and he turns all his hatred against a cruel God that doomed him to this fate. But Judas appears once more. After Jesus' trial before Pilate, Judas sings one of the biggest hits of the show, Superstar. That track was released as the album's lead single. It's a step away from the story and a moment of philosophizing. It sums up some of the main questions asked by the story. Who and what was Jesus? If he was truly the son of God, why did he appear when he did? And most of all, is it possible to separate the myth from the man? Every time I look at you, I don't understand Why you let the things you did get so out of hand You'd have managed better if you'd had And then our album ends on Jesus' crucifixion and an instrumental piece John 1941. That title refers to the following Bible line. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a new garden, and in the new garden, a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Upon its release, Jesus Christ Superstar caused quite a stir. It was banned by the BBC for a moment and condemned by a number of religious groups for its portrayal of Judas and its refusal to show Jesus' resurrection. But at the same time, it captured its audience. It blew up in the United States, and soon enough, it found its way onto Broadway and into a 1973 film. That legacy has continued into the modern age because the story continues to be so relevant. It's one of the founding myths of the Western world, viewed through an unusual lens. The medium of rock and roll draws obvious comparisons between Jesus and our own superstars. It asks a question, was Jesus truly a holy figure? Or was he just the Beatles of his day? And it conjures questions about the nature of power and the realities of fate and destiny. Musically, it weaves a complex story but keeps enough catchy melodies and hooks to keep the listener involved. It was something utterly different, something nobody could have expected, but something that seems so necessary in hindsight. It helped rock find its way into musical theater and it kicked off the careers of two of the greatest artists of our age. And perhaps most of all, it gave us a new way to look at a story we've been telling for 2,000 years. If you like watching my channel, there's a good chance you're into learning new things, and one of the best ways to learn new things is with Brilliant. Brilliant is a site that helps you master complex topics by solving fun, challenging problems. And now Brilliant courses are available offline. That means you can learn something easily while on the go without racking up data costs. You can download interactive courses through the mobile app, and you'll be able to solve problems in math, science, and more, even in the most remote corners of the world. What's really great about these courses is that they're interactive. You can play around with pendulum clocks to learn the physics of motion, or learn probability by playing blackjack. If you're looking for a suggestion, why not try out the Waves course, where you can learn all about the different kinds of waves, including the applications that wave science has in music technology. If you want to give it a shot, head on over to brilliant.org slash polyphonic. Not only will that show support for my channel, but the first 200 viewers will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So please follow that link to support my channel and start learning something new.